Yes. I think we are all in. Yes. Okay. Yes, we are, Mr. Paul Vector. Yes. Hereby officially open this uh, academic ceremony in which, in which Mr. Faris Al Masabi will defend his academic thesis, which is entitled Deep Brain Stimulation in Tinnitus Insights from the Pathophysiology and Mechanisms of Action. Mr. Al Masabi, may I invite you to present a summary of your thesis and your study and your conclusions in the next 50 minutes. I give you the word. Thank you. Dear board rector, dear members of the corona, dear supervisor, dear family, friends, and audience. In the next 15 minutes, I will shortly present an overview of my thesis entitled Deep Brain Stimulation, Insight, Insights from the Bathophysiology and Mechanism of Action. Tinnitus. Tinnitus is commonly defined as the perception of sound without an external source. The prevalence of tinnitus is unfortunately high. In a recent study, around 21% of the general Dutch population have tinnitus. In around half of them, tinnitus cause suffer that range from low to very large problem. Around 9% of the population had what can be called either some tinnitus, and in around 2%, tinnitus is very large problem. So what is the common consequences of having tinnitus on daily life activities? Well, tinnitus sufferers often have concentration problem that usually interfering with their work and social interaction and also cause them sleep problems. In addition, psychiatric disorders are common comorbidity for, for tinnitus sufferers. Around one third or more of tinnitus sufferers have comorbidity of depression and anxiety disorders. Even suicidal ideation has been reported among tinnitus patients. The main risk factor for tinnitus is hearing loss. People who report high level of noise exposure, whether it was for leisure, or occupational are more likely to have tinnitus. Another important risk factor is stress. Some patients have reported that their tinnitus started during stressful events in their life. It's, clo it, it's clear that stress can also make tinnitus even worse for the affected persons. The question then, is there any treatment? Unfortunately, so far, no drug has been approved by the US Food and Drug Administration or the European Medicines Agency. What available for the patient is the conservative therapy options like cognitive behavioral therapy and hearing aids. Those options doesn't treat tinnitus itself, but it can help patient to cope with the distress caused by tinnitus. However, some patients are resistant to, those, to these options and they need medical care. The lack of treatment option for tinnitus is partially due to our limited understanding of tinnitus pathophysiology. The anatomical location of tinnitus used to be thought the ear. However, nowadays, it's clear that changes in the brain are necessary for tinnitus generation and maintenance. It was seen that suctioning of the eight cranial nerve that transfers sound from ear to the brain, section of this nerve may not result in, change, in changes in tinnitus perception. Therefore, it is no longer thought that tinnitus is purely peripheral phenomena. Rather, its changes in the brain uh, in the central nervous system are essential for tinnitus pathophysiology. The research focus also shift toward the brain for investigation, the tinnitus pathophysiology, and for searching for a novel treatment. 
one of the suggested therapy option for tinnitus is deep brain stimulation. Deep brain stimulation has been introduced three decades ago for motor disorders and showed high successful rate for some motor and medication refractory disorders. It is now an approved treatment for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, obsessive compulsive disorder, epilepsy, and dystonia. And deep brain stimulation is a potential therapy for other neurological disorder like tinnitus and other mood disorders. Deep brain stimulation is a minimal invasive surgery where electrode implanted in certain region in the brain in order to deliver electrical stimulation. So the question asks, does it work in tinnitus? And which brain region to target? And what is the mechanism of action of its therapeutic benefits? Here we can see here we can see a diagram that show the major auditory brain regions. The sound transfer from the ear in the cochlea, in the inner ear from the cochlea to cochlear nucleus, then ascend to inferior curriculus, medial geniculate body, then auditory cortex. In all subcortical region, deep brain stimulation has been tested in preclinical study. And in all of them, deep brain stimulation was able to elevate tinnitus behavioral symptom in noise trauma animal model. Among them, the medial geniculate body is the most surgical accessible brain target among these structures. Therefore, the medial geniculate body will be the focus of my thesis. The objective of my thesis are, first, studying, first, studying the pathophysiology mechanism of tinnitus. In this regard, both an animal model of tinnitus and human brain samples obtained from tinnitus patient has been used for this objective. The second objective is to study the mechanism of action of medial geniculate body, deep brain stimulation, in noise trauma, in the noise trauma animal model of tinnitus. This is a roadmap of my thesis. First, a review of the medial geniculate body rule in tinnitus pathophysiology and implication of treat for treatment. Second, we test changes in brain activity markers in noise trauma animal model. In addition, neuronal activity was measured after medial geniculate body deep brain stimulation in order to find the mechanism of action. Third, since regating function of the medial geniculate body was tested in noise trauma and control animals. Additionally, the effect of medial geniculate body deep brain stimulation on sensory gating was tested. Fourth and fifth, we have tested the pathological changes in human post-mortem brain samples obtained from tinnitus patient. Neuronal and glial cells was tested in auditory, in auditory and non-auditory region, as well as specific cell types, including serotonergic, dopaminergic, glutamatergic, and GABAergic neurons. So in my review, we can take out that the, the medial geniculate body is a core region in tinnitus pathophysiology. This was based on human neuroimaging findings and findings obtained in animal models of tinnitus. Second, targeting MGB for treating tinnitus might be helpful. It has been shown that experimental, uh, experimental thalamic ablation result in 50% to total reduction of tinnitus in half of the tested patient. Ablation surgery has been replaced by deep brain stimulation nowadays. Another line of evidence was seen in motor disorder patients that have also a coexistence of tinnitus. Some studies have shown that motor thalamus deep brain stimulation helped in reducing tinnitus as well in those patients. And finally, as, as mentioned before, medial geniculate body deep brain stimulation has proved its efficacy for elevating tinnitus in the noise trauma animal model of tinnitus. So the first part of my thesis 
utilized animal studies. Here, Neustroma was used as tinnitus model due to its similarity with the most common cause of tinnitus in human, which is hearing loss. Also, Neustroma model may produce a more chronic form of tinnitus compared to the pharmacological model. My, uh, the, the main finding of these uh, animal studies showed first, decrease the metabolic activity in auditory and non-auditory regions, mainly the limbic system, specifically the medial genitalia body and auditory cortex and hippocampus has been shown decreased metabolic activity. Second, increased neuronal activity was shown in the auditory cortex. Third, increased evoked potential response in the medial genitalia body was seen in noise exposed animal. Fourth, noise trauma caused decreased MGB media genitalia body filtering capacity in, in, no, in noise trauma animal model. Here we can see an example of one brain marker I have used to measure brain metabolic activity. This is a rat brain tissue stained with enzyme called cytochrome C oxidase. The intense, the color, it's indicate more metabolic activity. As you can see, this upper panel is representative an example of noise trauma goo, and the lower panel represents an example of control group animals. We can see that the intensity of colors with, uh, is reduced in, in noise trauma group in the auditory cortex, in the medial genitalia body as well, and in the CA1 of the hippocampus. This represents a decreased metabolic activity. Additionally, in order to investigate the mechanism of action of medial genitalia body, Deep brain, stimulation, uh, deep brain stimulation, we have used a neuronal activity marker. We notice an increase of neuronal activity in thalamic reticular nucleus when deep brain stimulation switched on. Here, again, this is a right brain tissue stained with another marker called CFOS staining. The more positive neuron indicate increased neuronal activity. Here is a magnification uh, photo where we can see a more FOS expression when stimulation, when deep brain stimulation is switched on, which indicate hyperactivity or increased neuronal activity. Secondly, I studied the pathological changes in human post-mortem samples. In my review, we noticed that human neuroimaging studies show inconclusive data, and in some cases, contradictory result, especially when we consider structural changes. This might be due to limited resolution and ability to access cellular level by these, model, these techniques. Additionally, finding in animal models need validation from human data. We are not sure if, we, if animal perceive tinnitus as in human and validation so far has not been done at cellular level. So, Surprisingly, human post-mortem investigation has not been conducted in tinnitus thus far. We started the first study to investigate the pathological changes in human post-mortem samples. We contact two national brain banks, the Netherlands and the UK brain banks, in order to obtain brain tissue from people that had tinnitus in their clinical profile. Our main finding were Cell degeneration in auditory region, namely the medial genitalia body and the inferior colliculus. Substantial reduction of serotonergic neuron was seen in raphe nuclei. Reduced glutamergic neuron in the medial genitalia body and reduced GABAergic neuron in the inferior colliculus body and the inferior colliculus in tinnitus samples. And we notice quite difference in cell composition between human and rodents. The abergic neuron was reported to form less than one percentage of the medial genitalia body neurons in rat brain. In our case, we found in human sample around 10 percentage of total neuronal count are gabergic neuron in the, MG, in the medial genitalia body. Here 
we can see an example from human brain tissue of the medial geniculate body. On the left side, stellitus samples, and in the right side, healthy control. This is a nasal staining, a standard histological staining for neurons. We can see reduced number of neurons in stellitus sample. Additionally, we stain the same region against glutamergic neurons. And the same direction was found. Reduced glutamergic neurons uh, was seen in tinta samples. This is an example for serotonergic neuron in the dorsal raphe nucleus, where tinnitus patients have less number of serotonergic neurons, as you can see in the zoom photo. In addition, there is a quite morphological difference where tinnitus cases show pale neurons and thinner and shorter axon compared to healthy control. Finally, a conclusion. First, the medial geniculate body is a key target for treating tinnitus patient. Second, apparent brain, brain activity was found in auditory and limbic region in the noise trauma tinnitus animal model. Third, auditory and non-auditory regions are involved <coughs> In pathophysiology, cell degeneration, neuroinflammation, and serotonergic dysfunction may participate in the patho in tinnitus pathophysiology. And fourth, it's important to acquire human data in order to understand tinnitus pathophysiology, especially when considering tinnitus subjective nature and the variation between species in cell composition. And with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention. And now I will give the floor back to to the director. Thank you very much, Mr. Candidate, for your very nice illustrated uh, presentation. I would like to give you my compliments for your clear presentation and your and your conclusion at the end. We have now uh, remaining 45, 44 minutes for opening uh, your discussion, and the 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 opposition will be opened by Professor Stockholz. Professor Stockholz was also a member of your assessment committee, and he is affiliated with the University of Utrecht. I'd like to give him the first word, Professor Stockholz. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Prorector, uh, dear candidate. Uh, congratulations at first with your impressive thesis. Uh, my congratulations also to your family and friends and uh, especially also to your promotion team, uh, uh, Professor Temel, uh, Dr. Jan Shahari, and Dr. Janssen. Uh, it's an impressive work, providing really innovative insights in the central auditory pathway uh, and the pathophysiology of tinnitus. So I truly enjoyed it. Um, and chapter two, uh, you provide a very uh, central role in the MDB in tinnitus. And there are two models uh, you mentioned, and that's the thalamocortical dysrhythmia model uh, causing these aberrant cortical oscillations. And the second is the noise cancellation hypothesis summarized as a gating mechanism. So um, then there are also two clinical entities, uh, uh, um, uh, that's hyperacusis and tinnitus, which are linked but are separate clinical entities and also may occur independently. So after your quite extensive studies, uh, uh, what have you learned about the uh, viability of those theories regarding tinnitus and hyperacusis? Um, highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your compliment and your kind word, uh, your, your question. Uh, uh, I, if I understand you well, you ask about the uh, comorbidity, the common comorbidity of other auditory disorder with tinnitus, like hyperacusis and hearing loss. So I, I think, in my opinion, this is one of the major challenges in, in the field of neuro, uh, in the field of tinnitus research. Uh, what I notice in the review specifically, uh, the, uh, the functional MRI, st uh, functional MRI studies uh, in the past didn't account for hyperacusis. So you can find many articles that they describe the tinnitus patient, but they don't mention anything about hyperacusis. But in the recent years, more articles describe that, okay, we exclude hyperacusis or we have ex uh, hyperacusis. And when I look deep, when hyperacusis excluded the activity 
the reported bold signal in uh, MGB is reduced. Uh, so yes, I think it's it, the the general studies before that was in the direction of hyper uh, increased bold signal, but when taken into account uh, or excluding hyperacusis, many uh, two studies actually uh, report decreased uh, functional activity. Uh, I think this is important to address in future studies. It's unfortunate that um, sometimes you are uh, hesitate to use all the reference because it doesn't measure of these uh, uh, confounders. But I think it's important, as you mentioned, uh, in the clinic uh, in the research. Right. Um, so uh, you also mentioned now in, in your answer that there is uh, an electrophysiological gain measured. Um, um, and, and also in fMRI studies, there is a, a functional inhibition suggested. So how do you link these two with tinnitus? Because they seem to be contradictory findings, or am I wrong there? Yeah, so uh, this, it is, uh, as you can see, uh, it's, it's hard topic to, many, uh, to ad address. I have similar impact in my tissue uh, in uh, chapter three, where I can find the metabolic activity reduced, and in the same brain tissue, this is a, a post-mortem tissue, so we don't, it's not uh, physiological or dynamic changes. So in the same tissue, the marker of neuronal activity increased, and it was uh, quite interesting. It, uh, it, it may be maybe because of the overlapping of tinnitus and hyperacosis and hearing loss. This is possibility. Uh, and uh, I, I think in order to uh, evaluate this accurately, uh, the, the article that show, uh, in animal at least now, and the article that show this finding could relate with the tinnitus symptom, could give us more, uh, uh -huh. more uh, uh, trust if, if for this. go to this chapter three, um, since you mentioned that, um, I was wondering regarding chapter three, um, uh, you're using the, well, tried and tested noise damage model, uh, but in your reflection in the end, which I liked very much, you said, well, I'm not completely sure if this worked in all animals, at least we didn't really test through if this uh, animal model uh, of noise damage really, uh, really worked. Uh, and that's, that's obviously a weakness in, in this old, otherwise impressive study. Uh, another main uh, problem in, in, in our daily clinical practices, uh, or another much used animal model, is, is the use of canamycin and, uh, and, and some diuretics to deafen animals. So using autotoxicity models, which absolutely, uh, which also have a different influence on the inner ear, on the, the cell population, which you demonstrate. So have you considered using uh, or trying to overcome this limitation by using another way of deafening these animals? Yeah, so I think, so we select this model uh, based on um, uh, advantage that fit our research question. So the other model, the pharmacological model like salicylate model, it's commonly used. Uh, I think the noise trauma is more and is widely used. Uh, in our case, because we test different modality of stimulation and we want to link the pathophysiology also when, when we apply treatment, we would like to keep the same model. So we select the noise trauma model. Uh, yeah, it, I think it's also we can manipulate some aspect, but no model will uh, represent fully the patient and the heterogeneity of tinnitus. But I think, yeah, in future... I, I fully agree. Then, then, if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, for one short final question. You still have two minutes. Oh, good. Well, um, I have more <laughs> questions than minutes, so that is also the quality of your work uh, causing this. Uh, I was fascinated by Chapter 5, by, uh, by the findings, uh, the neurodegenerative findings you, you demonstrated for the first time, actually. Um, and um, we know that, that, that hearing loss and tinnitus, which is linked, is an important contributor to, uh, to the 
prevalence or, or incidence in Alzheimer's disease. So a lot of uh, treatment algorithms are based on that uh, in this time. But um, since you had these findings of these, these, these neurodegenerative uh, uh, processes in the central auditory system, um, is this a, uh, so, so what comes first? Is it the degeneration that comes first and then afterwards leading to Alzheimer's? Is it part of the same process or is it uh, secondary? So uh, should we keep doing what we are doing and that's treating the hearing loss uh, 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 energetically? What, what is your opinion based on your studies? Uh, thank you for your kind word. I, 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 I do agree the the so right now we uh, uh, tinnitus and hearing loss are connected to Alzheimer as you mentioned. And, uh, and I also refer to the study that show after you diagnose with tinnitus, uh, it's one and a half one point five times more likely people will get Alzheimer or Parkinson's uh, so neurodegenerative disorders. Uh, my data is aligned with this, and in my opinion, yeah, the zone of treating patient is, is important. May um, I don't have data to support this, but um, uh, this this may be um, uh, degeneration may uh, accumulate of uh, toxic uh, for uh, neurons and may spread. But uh, I think the way now is what available is treating for hearing loss. Is uh, there is treatment for hearing loss? Unfortunately, not in tinnitus, but uh, I hope in the future. Uh, but yes, I totally do agree. Uh, we should keep focus on treating those patients. We'll work on this further. Thank you very much for your answers. I'm really, really happy with your answers. So I will give the word back to uh, the product or process language. Thank you very much. And uh, we immediately will continue with Dr. Hashlam. She was a member of your uh, assessment committee. This morning, she's officially the secretary of the of the committee as well, and she's affiliated with the Department of Neurosurgery here at Maastricht University, and I'd like to give her the next word. Yes, thank you. Dear candidate, first of all, I would like to congratulate you on this achievement, and equally, I would like to extend my congratulations uh, to the promotion team. Um, I have read your thesis with great interest, uh, but I was still wondering about a few things. And in particular, I have a few questions on chapter three. Um, so the group of study two that you call sham, um, I know from the publication that you cite, it's not a true sham group because these animals have actually been stimulated uh, on several occasions before using different stimulation parameters. So I was wondering, did you consider any carryover effects uh, or effects on plasticity um, from these stimulation sessions? Steam opponent, uh, thank you for your kind word and uh, compliments, and thank you for your questions. Yes, indeed, uh, yeah, this is, uh, so in our model, we, we, in order to test the deep brain stimulation, this study was a replicate for deep brain stimulation on tinnitus, purely tinnitus, two group of both have noise exposed uh, trauma. And this is a replicated. And when we found that the same finding in behavioral, it's published by my colleague Hosta, uh, the same finding, this is assurance. But uh, another limitation came up is that we uh, stimulate the control group, the sham, the sham group in this case. Uh, so yes, it's a limitation that I also mentioned it in the end. Uh, therefore, uh, I, I think, Oh, so it's, we, there was a, a gap between the stimulation. It's not the stimulate then sacrifice the animal, uh, like uh, in uh, the mechanism of action of GBD brain stimulation that I uh, refer in uh, C for staining. But in this case, no, uh, there is gap. It could have impact in this, yes, I, I, I do agree. Uh, but why, why we uh, think, yes, maybe, this is less likely, or we are, yeah, we we mentioned this as a limitation, but uh, we think it's no, it's not much likely because the stimulation was occur in both group. So the different factor here is noise trauma. And we also compare it with the, um, with the other, uh, uh, with the published uh, result. And 
this is also why we include C for staining in this uh, tissue. It's already been done quite times in uh, noise trauma model, and we have similar result as others. But you didn't um, include any um, staining on synaptic plasticity. So I was just wondering, what would you expect? Would, uh, would there be an effect on plasticity stemming from these stimulation sessions, or you don't expect any effects as well? I, no, I think there will be plasticity. Uh, so this is just from the other uh, um, uh, DBS application. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't uh, test that. Uh, we were just focused on the most affected region. Uh, our ultimate goal is to find a possible target for deep brain stimulation. Uh, so this is one step, uh, but it also helped in uh, understanding the pathophysiology. But I, I totally agree. Uh, this would be beneficial uh, and should be considered. Okay. All right, and then my next question is um, with regards to the current spread of stimulation. Um, so from a recent uh, rodent study that we performed, we saw that um, stimulation with high frequency actually leads to a current spread in the rodent brain of around 400 micrometers in diameter. So I was wondering which structures are close to the MGB uh, that might have been affected. Um, so what is their function and did you observe any side effects when applying DBS? So 400 huh, microbes. Yeah, so uh, in the study that done uh, where behavioral measurement has done, uh, Huska did um, check for behavioral assessment for anxiety uh, and uh, for uh, in previous study also hearing level and both were normal, no, no uh, sign of anxiety, increase in anxiety or uh, hearing uh, problem after deep brain stimulation. And the MGB is a is, uh, big structure. I, I, I'm not, we call it now by ha head, uh, how thick, uh, how wide it is, but uh, it's more than 400. Um, the location of the electrode was uh, in most cases uh, in the middle and the surrounding region uh, is the other thalamic region, which um, uh, it's maybe it's not so much linked to to uh, auditory pathway. Maybe this is also to the th thalamic reticular nucleus. It's 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 more um, uh, rostral to MGB. Um, yeah, this this could be, but I, I think uh, because we uh, with the when we test the um, uh, deep brain stimulation, uh, before sacrificing, we stimulate one hour, and there was group that used to be stimulated, but that hour was off, uh, then sacrifice, and uh, the TRN show this uh, effect. I think this is from stimulation, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then uh, my last question is uh, with regard to the stimulation parameter. So I noticed that you're stimulating the animals with a monophasic um, pulse shape. Um, so I was just wondering, I think the patient, the tinnitus patient that is currently implanted with DBS um, is also being stimulated with monophasic or biphasic. I don't know, maybe you can correct me in that. Um, so uh, I know that biphasic is actually more often used um, to minimize the risk of tissue damage. So I was just uh, wondering if you can elaborate a bit more why you chose those particular stimulation parameters. So why did you choose monophasic over biphasic? Uh, well, the, uh, I, uh, so this is the, the stimulation parameter was, uh, the setup for stimulation was uh, already established uh, four or five years ago from, uh, this is a, a continuation line of research. Uh, uh, started by Jasper, then Hosta, and um, my to my uh, my work, uh, the the parameter selected was just uh, in behavioral study and showed its efficacy. So we keep the same parameters uh, in order to see the mechanism of action. Uh, I agree with you. Maybe uh, this will be less uh, damage to the tissue, and this may be. Uh, Possibility that why uh, when we when I do C for staining in the control group and in the tinnitus uh, group I couldn't see any force reaction in the MGB 
except the medial part. So, uh, yeah, I think it it it's was more much um, yeah stronger effect. But yeah, this is uh, based on our previous study. Okay. So and then just out of curiosity, what is currently applied in the tinnitus patient? I really can't. So I I'm not I'm not sure. I, maybe I I need to check, but I I totally forget now. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, you've answered all my questions. So with that, I would like to give the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. And the opposition will be continued by Professor Fahid. I would, first of all, uh, like to thank him that he joins us and that he took time to be a member of our committee this morning. And I would like to gladly give him the word. Professor Fahid is professor in psychology at the Medical School of King Khalid University in Saudi Arabia. Professor Fahid, give you the word. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Prorector. And uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate for the candidate for this uh, and his promotion uh, team for this nice work uh, and nice thesis, which is written in a nice way. When I read it, uh, as if I'm reading a nice story, really. So congratulations uh, for all of you. Uh, I want to ask a question regarding chapter two and three, regarding the material and method. Uh, first, the question is, is it, it's been asked by Professor uh, Stockros regarding to why you select this method, but I will go to the other question. Uh, you know, the, the, the subject, the, the tinnitus, it is, it, is, it is a subjective symptoms. And in human research, it is, it is difficult to translate such symptoms in number. Uh, to give uh, to give a uh, scientific number, uh, and you are using a model which is a nice model, and it is uh, which is done by Tern and his colleagues. Uh, but my question uh, regarding sensitivity and specificity, what do you, what's your evaluation for this model to give you an accurate data? A highly esteemed opponent, uh, thank you for your kind word and compliments. And uh, thank you for all, uh, your question. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so as you mentioned, tinnitus is a subjective nature uh, disease. We rely on patient word. Patients say, I have the tinnitus, then it's, he, he, he is tinnitus patient, that's it. And uh, also the severity. Uh, it's uh, even if we use uh, questionnaire studies, uh, questionnaire, multi question uh, questionnaire, uh, it's also, the word of patient. Until now, we don't have an objective measurement for tinnitus in, in human. Uh, but in, in order to apply it in animal, uh, yeah, the question is, is uh, out of hand, <laughs> questioning animal. So uh, behavioral neuroscientist has uh, did a lot of work in this regard. Uh, and uh, one of, uh, widely used nowadays is the uh, GBS test. And basically, uh, the idea of all behavioral assessment that uh, for tinnitus is, is that tinnitus can be uh, any sound except silence. So basically they uh, implement silent in any way that if the tinnitus, if the animal doesn't perceive si silent, then uh, it reflects tinnitus. Um, uh, this model, as I mentioned, is widely used nowadays. Uh, it's relatively easy, doesn't need to train the animal. Uh, but it has been challenged uh, in animal and in human. So some studies report that in human it didn't work. Uh, so yeah, this, I think, still a limitation in uh, the field of tinnitus. Uh, but it's one of the best option we have in tinnitus. So, uh, we need to translate this uh, subjective disease in uh, objective measurement and uh, uh, reflex test uh, can give us this data. And, uh, and yes, uh, I, I think in my opinion, uh, it, it, uh, it show uh, a good um, reproducibility between labs. So uh, it, this is also uh, in uh, recent review about uh, the serial changes in uh, tinnitus. Uh, the authors, uh, uh, also uh, Susan Shur and her lab, also agree that uh, the GBS is one of the best options we have nowadays. Uh, so uh, yes, I think this is 
the way to go in in this regard. Okay, thank you for your answering. So uh, also are still in material and method and uh, uh, and your calculation for, for GBIS, your cal for calculation gap and, and no gap ratio, you select specific frequencies. Uh, and my question, how can you make sure that the frequencies that uh, the frequency, the specific frequency that use it, it is matching with the animal tinnitus? Yeah, so uh, for the frequency, uh, so usually what we do that we introduce uh, noise trauma in certain frequency. Uh, this is what we think it causes hearing loss uh, in those animal and uh, presumably also tinnitus and maybe also hypercosis. And when we test in behavioral, we use the same uh, frequencies, uh, so multiple frequency including the same frequency that used for hearing loss. Uh, what we learn, because we, we need to apply the noise in this frequency, then implement a gap or silent gap in uh, this to, in order to test the, the existence of tinnitus or not. So uh, what, uh, what uh, it's found uh, that yes, the tinnitus uh, frequency match the hearing uh, the the frequency that we used in, uh, to to produce uh, noise trauma, and this is in line with the uh, other uh, literature, where tinnitus usually uh, occur in uh, similar or close uh, by uh, to the frequency used in the, to induce tinnitus. Okay, thank you. Uh, going to chapter five, uh, it is regarding postmortem analysis of neurological uh, in human tinnitus. So one of your beauty finding it is that the decreased serotonin serotonogenic activity in in DRN rafi nucleus. Uh, so you know that the tinnitus it can be caused by psychiatric illness or by uh, alone or stress alone in some uh, in some animal research. And uh, your model, your animal model, uh, it is uh, it is the tinnitus it is secondary to the hearing loss. And here in human study it may be due to not hearing loss, maybe, maybe due to psychiatric illness. So do you think there is a difference to, com uh, to compare between the human study and the animal study in your, in your thesis or? Oh yeah, so yeah, for uh, serotonic uh, neuron dysfunction that we found. So actually uh, the stress model is just published in, uh, yeah, recently. Uh, and it was very fascinating uh, work, I would say. Uh, because what we learn from clinic that tinnitus subject uh, may, uh, at least uh, their tinnitus will provoked by stress. Uh, uh, there is some uh, reviews claim uh, quite proportion of patient. Uh, I read in one review, 50 percentage of uh, tinnitus patient got their tinnitus during stressful event like death of uh, close by family member or something like that. Uh, but I think we lack in um, uh, clear our uh, objective data of how stress, if the stress alone in human uh, cause of tinnitus. Uh, but we can safe say that it's, it's, it's involved. It may trigger the tinnitus, uh, provoke it and make it even worse. In my finding, it was surprising because uh, there is no previous data in serotonin neuron except in the pharmacological model. And that uh, this study is mostly old, uh, uh, and the difference was huge in our case. So we uh, found big, big difference in all okay. the four samples that we had. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. The last question uh, in the chapter six. I'll go chapter six, uh, and one of the, uh, your findings it's is that uh, with using uh, DBS with with with. Uh, with the with, uh, with, uh, animal, you found that neural activity, no, uh, it's in the post-mortem, you found that neural activity increase, okay, uh, in, in thalamic reticular nucleus, TRN, and you, you wrote a nice word, it is said that TRN could be act as a base maker for thalamic firing, means the thalamic it will fire, and it, would, uh, it will release uh, GABA. So my question: Do you do you think uh, if you if you concentrated in the TRN for not for the treatment, uh, just to make deep stimulation to TRN, 
uh, for treatment, not only tinnitus, for other disease like uh, movement disorders, dystonia, uh, it, it is, it is, it is, any, it is suggestive studies for future. Yeah, so uh, the thalamic reticular nucleus uh, is linked to many other uh, thalamic re uh, regions, so auditory and uh, visual and many others. And uh, it was uh, introduced, uh, suggested by uh, uh, Ross Schert um, in 2010 in gating mechanism. And even with not much evidence to support it uh, directly, Indirect evidence uh, show uh, that getting yes may participate. So in this case, TRN uh, may involve. In my review, I, I focus in TRN, but I couldn't find uh, many studies, not positive or negative result in TRN. But I think um, uh, it would be maybe more pharmacological target for tinnitus or others, uh, because uh, I also, face a difficulty in counting TRN in under microscope. It's very thin region that I'm not a neurosurgeon, but I expect neurosurgeon will, uh, yeah, it will, they will face a problem in uh, finding it with MRI and then localize it. So it's, it's, it's just few neurons embedded in white matter. And uh, in this case, yeah, I think it, uh, one of the reason why we choose MGB uh, one of the reasons uh, is it's surgically accessible. Uh, but TRN, I think it's, it's, it reserve uh, more attention, especially in the pathophysiology. And I, I saw in other disease like schizophrenia, is, uh, she is, uh, TRN is a, a key region for uh, other diseases. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, yes, I know from difficult, it is difficult point to DBS this time, but we hope in the future with nanotechnology, maybe DBS in the future, it will be easy and easy to do it in, in, in any, any part we need. Thank you very much for your answering the question. Okay, Mike to you, Director. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I would like to proceed swiftly to Dr. Reikers. She's affiliated with the Department of Neurosurgery at our Master University Medical Center. Professor Reikers, give you the word. Dr. Reikers. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Prorector. Congratulations, Mr. Candidate, uh, on all the work you've done. Uh, a thesis that was uh, well written. I read it with pleasure. I know you did a lot of immunohistochemistry and histology, and most of this work, I think, was carried out in the COVID period where the lab was more or less empty and you were there all the time, mostly by yourself or with the help of one or two colleagues. So uh, that must not mess must have been quite difficult circumstances. So compliments for that. Um, my question is also about chapter three and it's about the, uh, the model and in the way it's representative of the clinic. I'm not the first to ask questions about that. During your presentation, you have shown a very beautiful image, uh, the uh, metabolic marker, cytochrome oxidase. And one of the most remarkable findings is that it's uh, reduced in the hippocampus in the CA1 region in your uh, noise trauma model. My question is, is this an advantage of the model? Does it make it more representative of tinnitus or is it a disadvantage? And is it showing something else than tinnitus? Uh, esteemed opponent, thank you for your nice word and your compliments uh, and your question. Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, I think, so noise trauma, I think it's more representative for the patient that we would like to uh, 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 implant uh, DBS electrode. In this regard, overall, without regardless of my uh, findings. Uh, the pharmacological model, yes, it, it it caused tinnitus in human uh, with overdose, but this is not the frequent patient uh, who visit the clinic. Uh, however, I think uh, the, the, the tinnitus is a heterogeneous uh, disorder. Some have very hearing, uh, very bad hearing loss, and some doesn't have uh, audible uh, or clinical hearing loss. Uh, so, 
this is a limitation. If you select one parameter, then then you lose the other. So it will not be. Uh, we cannot uh, generalize it to other to all kinetic patient. Uh, in regard to hip, uh, hippocampus, yes. So also the heterogeneity of tinnitus, I think it's attained here. Uh, reviewing the literature, uh, some studies report a cognitive uh, problem in tinnitus patient. Uh, I think this is uh, so. Recent review, I read recent review that it's not. Um, there is no uh, enough evidence to support this. But the involvement of uh, hippocampus in general, uh, there is there is uh, um, more study represent changes in hippocampus uh, in among tinnitus patients, and um, the model of uh, thalamocortical dysrhythmia, which is introduced two decades ago, uh, it's it's uh, the more refinement uh, version of it, in, uh, published by Diederik uh, and colleague. Uh, they assume that in, when hearing loss is severe, then the uh, the the the, uh, the arithmetic problem will be shift from auditory cortex toward parahippocampal region, uh, mm -hmm. and this, therefore uh, it's, it's important, I think, in this regard. So you so the, the, it may be an advantage of the model that it shows hippocampal changes too. Yes, so I think because we induce in severe hearing loss, so okay. I think it makes sense. We have Thank you. Sense. Thank you. Then my second question is, um, if you're going to apply DBS of the MGB in the patients, uh, one patient is currently treated right now, uh, What do, do you expect certain side effects? Yeah, so, uh, I'm, so far, as I'm aware, that this patient didn't show any major complications, so I'm, we are very happy, I think, and the patient. Uh, but I think uh, we should pay attention to uh, the, the hearing status, so the hearing level. Uh, so in animal, uh, inferior calculus didn't cause hearing loss. DBS and inferior calculus doesn't uh, cause hearing loss. But um, hearing status is important. Um, also, the so this is in more or less, uh, but in motor disorder, um, uh, psychiatric uh, comorbidities, uh, depression after deep brain stimulation uh, occur a lot. Uh, it's worrying also with the, the finding I have found in the post-mortem chapter of severe reduction of serotonergic neuron. Uh, so this should be, I think, uh, take close, close look. Uh, in this uh, matter. Also the surgical complications. So uh, yeah, general surgical like bleeding and. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Okay, If do I have time for one more short question, uh, Mr. Prorector? Yes, there is time. Okay, um, you uh, also related to the uh, last two chapters where you uh, explained that there are many neurodegenerative changes and we've already talked about uh, Alzheimer's disease in this patient group. Do you think there should be an age limit to uh, DBS in tinnitus patients? Uh, well, I, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. I, I, I think I can speculate, but I think it's difficult to, uh, yeah, to answer uh, without uh, um, clinical uh, uh, yeah, clinical experience. But I think if I would start, I would start with where uh, other models end up. So uh, like motor disorders and um, mm -hmm. uh, if, if, the patient, if there is limit, then I will apply this limit at first because we still, I would say in the early phase of uh, trying DBS in tinnitus. Uh, mm -hmm. So the MGB or other target that used by others like codate nucleus, uh, I, I'm, I would apply the same uh, our recommendation from other diseases. And this is, I think, the beauty of uh, deep brain stimulation because we can learn from other diseases. Uh, it's now a broad treatment for many other uh, diseases and we can learn it. And any development in other uh, model uh, and other disease, it will maybe apply also uh, to tinnitus patients. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much.
for your answers. I give the word back to the to Mr. Prorector. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to swiftly proceed with uh, Dr. Kubben. He is also affiliated with the Department of Neurosurgery at our academic hospital here in Maastricht. And I'd like to give him the, 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 the opportunity for a final discussion with the candidate. Thank you. The candidates, also from my side, compliments for your thesis, impressive work, and uh, expanding the horizons of neurosurgery and functional neurosurgery in particular. Uh, so thank you for that. Also, my compliments to your uh, supervisory team. Um, I also like to kick off with a question about chapter two, but it's in a broader context also um, jumping uh, to the discussion. Um, you just said in the discussion with uh, Dr. Reikers that it's also good to learn from other indications. And now when I uh, especially look at an impressive figure at page 16 about the, the anatomical correlations, I'm wondering, zooming out a bit on the topic, why do you, do we choose for the MGB or tinnitus? instead of reusing targets which we already have more experience with, like the accumbens nucleus, which has also been described for tinnitus and which is also involved in the, in the network. And my philosophy, DBS, is to put it simply more about jamming the networks and not so much about targeting a specific area. So why do we need to go to another new area? Steve Abonnet, thank you for your uh, kind word and your compliments and your question. Yeah, so, uh, I can't debate in uh, your experience with the, the selecting the target, but I do believe that uh, uh, in order to searching for uh, treatment of uh, patient or for uh, target for deep brain stimulation, uh, one uh, one let's say one major uh, idea that we should think is the involvement of this region in the pathophysiology of this disease. And as you mentioned, uh, a couple of studies has reported uh, nucleus accumbens uh, involvement in uh, tinnitus, but other also show no uh, involvement of it. And I think it's received less attention than uh, the auditory region. Uh, it may be also uh, that when we target uh, nucleus accumbens, we not treat tinnitus, but treat the distress accompany tinnitus. Uh, in, my, in my opinion, it's we, we are we are better to target uh, the disease itself, the this, the tinnitus itself, rather than targeting the accompany distress. Uh, in this regard, if, because uh, in this in this regard we can have both the reduced the loudness of tinnitus and also the distress. And uh, uh, as I mentioned in my review. Uh, so the motor thalamus and uh, STN has shown, the uh, DBS uh, of this region has shown effect. They are close by, they are not linked to tinnitus by any means, they are motor region, but uh, maybe maybe it's uh, the spread of the uh, stimulation current uh, reach the MGB and therefore this slightly improvement in tinnitus has been occurred. And I think it's important uh, at least in preclinical research to apply, to test new regions. And uh, with the positive feedback that we saw in our region, uh, yeah, I think we are ready to go to the next step and uh, cautious apply for deep brain stimulation in this region. Okay, well, at least you convinced me that based on the preclinical work, there's been um, sufficient debate, sufficient conscious consideration to, to move forward. So I think that's good because especially once we go to the, the human trials, which are currently uh, ongoing, it helps also to be able to explain that this is not just another new region with somebody who, well, let's say, like to play. Uh, so that, that's a positive thing. The other thing, um, we're focusing here on the brain stimulation. I'm one of the neurosurgeons doing it, so, but still, why do we need DBS? in the severe tinnitus cases. For example, the pre region also has been demonstrated to be involved. And that one could be reached by, for example, repetitive TMS. So we'll talk about refractory uh, tinnitus patients, um, which we're now, um, uh, in which we're performing invasive brain procedures. Um, did you compare to repetitive TMS or why would we choose DBS over a non-invasive alternative? Yeah, so, uh... Uh, the neuromodulation and all, it's, it's, a, it's a, hot to, a hot topic in the uh, tinnitus field. Uh, this non-invasive uh, 
models are more common to studies. Uh, and uh, I think it's me more than 10 years uh, of uh, different clinical trial. I just recently read a, re uh, a review paper that showed that uh, RTMS indeed significantly improved tinnitus. Uh, I think uh, this, is, oh, this is really encouraging and uh, uh, good news. But uh, yeah, I think first thing we need to, uh, to study the long-term effect of these modalities on patient. Uh, the second thing, I, uh, I agree, but to shortly interrupt, also given time, um, should we then tell uh, your promotion team to stop the current uh, tinnitus trial with the MGB, MGB DBS in humans to wait for the RTMS results? No, uh, so it's, it's uh, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> I think many, uh, many, many studies have shown it, but the, this meta analysis show significant. Uh, and Mr. Candidate, you are allowed to uh, finish your answer. So take your time, no problem. Okay, so uh, basically those patients who in, in, uh, in operated for deep brain stimulation, we should exclude any patient that can benefit from other treatment. So they should try other treatment. Uh, if this is successfully uh, implemented in clinic and approved, then they should go for non-invasive thin uh, this modality. And even if they're pharmacological treatment, this is the first step. It's invasive, but I think it should be limited for refractory patient. And that's why our promotion team and uh, want to implement this. Okay, thank you very much. I enjoy the answer to the discussion. I hand the word back to the prorector. Thank you very much. And I'm going to finish now officially your, your defense. So basically, uh, Mr. al Masabi, the time appointed for defending your thesis has now passed. The degree committee will will online at least go back to a different a, di a different atmosphere, let's call it like this. We're going to discuss the quality of your thesis, but that has already been accepted by your assessment committee. But in particular, we're going to discuss the way you have defended your thesis this morning. And I, I requested you and your company online will wait till we will be returned to this main aula to give our final results to you. Thank you very much. So I guess, yes.
Uh, you are still muted, Prorector, sir. I check, yeah. Dear Mr. Fardis al Masami, the degree committee here present has assessed not so much the quality of your thesis, but moreover, the way you have defended your thesis this morning. In view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you officially the degree of doctor. And I can see a big smile on your face, so that maybe that you accepted this degree. Very nice. Professor, Professor Temel is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university customs. And therefore, I invite your supervisor now to take the word. I give you the word, Professor Timmel. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? Yes, I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Faris Al Masabi, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now will present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary, and all the members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university online at a different yes. Thank you. And I'm not finished yet, uh, uh, Dr. Almasabi, because on behalf of the Graduate School of Men's Mental Health and Neuroscience, I'm also entitled to hand out this official certificate you will get this certificate during the lunch this afternoon. And the reason that you receive this certificate is that the owner of the certificate has shown to have received adequate training in diverse academic skills and has gained relevant experience to become a successful and independent scholar. Again, congratulations. And now I'm passing the word to your co-promoter, Dr. Janssen, to do the laudatio. No, first, one moment. First, we're going to applaud for the candidate. That's also a point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that's, you so that's, much. That's nice too. Thank you. Okay. And later we applaud for the laudatio. Dr. Janssen, you give you the word. Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Dear Dr. Almasabi, dear Fres, uh, also on behalf of uh, Yasin and uh, Ali uh, on the other screen, I really would like to congratulate you by obtaining this uh, PhD degree. Also, my uh, congratulations to your wife. I, I of course, I cannot see you, but I'm sure you are online. Uh, your parents, uh, your brothers, sisters, all, all your family. For us, as you stated in the, the last proposition, the only impossible journey is the one you never begin. Well, for us, you started this journey a couple of years ago, and today you completed it. After your medical study, you obtained a PhD scholarship from the King Khalid University. On the 17th of July, 2016, you informed Yasin Temel by email that this scholarship was approved. You decided to come to the Netherlands with your wife and started this journey moving from Saudi Arabia to Maastricht. I still remember the first day we met for us uh, in the laboratory. And in the beginning, it was difficult for you. You still had to master also the English language, but the journey had started. At the beginning, you already had a clear destination for your journey in mind. You wanted to achieve this goal of obtaining this PhD title. But like in all journeys, roads were sometimes bumpy time to time, and sometimes different directions had to be taken to reach the final destination. Nonetheless, what I have seen, you developed yourself as a person during this journey and as a scientist. You spent hours, days, evenings to count neurons behind the microscope. The post-mortem study, all this effort was not 
for nothing. This postmortem study conducted on human brain samples was really pioneer work. And together with the studies conducted in animals, this has moved the field in the tinnitus research forward. Something to be proud of. In the last years, this also resulted in several peer-reviewed manuscripts in international journals. You were not only a scientist when you were here at FRS. You co combined all your work with being a parent. In Maastricht, your first uh, son, Ryan, was born in 2018. At the beginning of this year, you also had a second son, Ahmed. Combining parenthood and research, especially in COVID times, was not always easy. In this respect, for instance, I first would like to address a few words to your wife, Fatima. Fatima, you moved to Maastricht together with Fares and supported him in his PhD journey. Thank you for supporting him and taking care of him and of the family. Besides being a lovely wife and mother, you also studied here at Maastricht University. Coincidence, I think, doesn't exist. This afternoon, you will also receive your degree. My congratulations, and I would like to ask everyone also to applaud for this. Thank you, thank you, in behalf of Sarah. Aris, this brings me slowly to the end of my laudatio. As you know, in Maastricht, this is the birthplace of the European Union. It's where the treaty was negotiated and signed. With this, Maastricht helped to enhance the focus given to the role of education and training in Europe. The overarching goal is to encourage the emergence of highly qualified and adaptable individuals to strengthen also social cohesion and active citizenship. I also encourage you, Fares, to share your learned skills and knowledge in the field of tinnitus and be a role model and inspiration to young people in Saudi Arabia. Be an ambassador for Maastricht University. Thank you, thank you so much, dear Mark, dear Dr. Janssen. I really uh, proud of this journey and I think it's one of the best uh, journey in my life. I learned a lot, as you mentioned, it was a rough start, but I learned a lot. So. Uh, thank you, thank you so much for you and for Ali and for Yasi. You were uh, really the head that I target to to improve myself. And um, thank you for your patience. I know it wasn't uh, the start without master degree was uh, somehow difficult, but you were patient, and I'm proud of this uh, accomplishment. So really, really thank you. Thank you, Faraz, and thereby I would like to give also the word back to the pro-rector. Thank you very much. And Dr. Dr. Al-Masabi, I think it looks nice if you hear the word Dr. Al-Masabi for the first time, I noticed. Also on behalf of Master University and of our College of Deans, I would like to congratulate, congratulate you with your achievement. And in this, of course, your family, I just understand by chat that you are not far away in Saudi Arabia, but you're just simply at home and that you had some surgery on your knees or something like that. So basically, you're not that far away. You're basically physically in the mastery area, um, to my surprise. But anyway, I also would like to congratulate you, your family, which are online, I suppose. Uh, but I also like to congratulate, of course, your promotion team who are here, all here. And I think it's a splendid job. I must, I must confess, I read your, myself, I read your thesis with interest. And I also in your presentation, I, uh, I read in particular with interest your chapter five, since I was never really aware of the relation between tinnitus and depression. And I really, I really found this, this, this observation rather, rather interesting for a further discussion. I also would like to thank all the members of the Corona who joined us today, who had to prepare some questions or to adjust, I always say, it just takes seven minutes to, uh, to, to discuss with the candidates. It takes more than seven minutes to prepare these questions. And that's for them, 
I would like uh, I would like to thank them. But special thanks goes, of course, to our guest, Professor Hayat in uh, in Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Stockhouse far away in Utrecht. In the so we have to think about that. And by saying this, I normally we would have a reception, we would have some festiv festivities, but uh, in this online world. There's just a button I have to push and it's over and that's really unfortunate. But I do wish you, Dr. Amasabi, a very nice day. This is an important day in your life. It's where, where the, all lights shines on you today. So enjoy it and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And that's by saying this, I officially close this session. Thank you.